Okay. It's a little bit difficult following two uh, economists who uh, share a lot of my concerns and interests, but I think also there's significant differences in our approach. I like to pick and choose. I've read <laughs> both of them <laughs> enthusiastically. But I, I think uh, I have a diff I think I have more uh, uh, desire to learn from other fields and disciplines. And I think that uh, understanding speculative prices is not something for economists alone. I'm married to a psychologist, by the way. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about speculative prices. I'm, I'm also, I think over the years I've evolved into something a little bit more like a business economist. Uh, and less abstract. I'm going to show you plots of data. Uh, I, I also, I'm going to refer to this, what Jean Fama called nefarious term, bubbles. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is, wh what is a bubble? You said nobody defines it, so I will define it. A, a, a speculative bubble is a fad. People get excited sometimes, too excited about phenomena, uh, investing. Prices start going up, they start talking, the newspapers start writing about it. More and more people pile into a market and they push prices up more. And it goes on for a while. If it can't go on forever and eventually breaks and the bubble bursts. I'll say it now, Gene thinks that there's, uh, you didn't get to your point about, uh, uh, about uh, behavioral finance, but I think behavioral finance is a very important component of finance that stands alongside the uh, other approach, approaches. I guess Lars was getting into behavioral finance at the end. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we are, we are very like-minded in some ways, but I'm going to probably emphasize the differences here. So the idea, uh, I think we date it often to Gene Fama, the idea of efficient markets is an idea that there are no bubbles. Everything that goes on in financial markets is smart people figuring out the facts. Efficient incorporation of uh, information into prices. And as Gene says, however, what does that mean Testable. What's testable about that? What, that that's a, a, a very broad statement. So we have to make it into a model. And historically, uh, I have a lot of slides. I, I'm going to just talk, and you can read the slides. <laughs> there's too much here. But there's something called the present discounted value in finance. Uh, the, and the theory here is that the value of any investment, let's say a corporate stock, is the public's expected present value of the future payments it will make. So stocks pay dividends. If you buy a share of a stock, you'll get a check in the mail at regular intervals. And the idea is that the efficient markets theory prices all of those future dividends. So it's the that's the equation that I have up there. And it price this, this is the simplest form of the efficient markets model which I, I, our authors have already gone, uh, uh, Fema and Hansen have already s gone beyond in their talk. But I want to I start out, uh, as Lars said, no model is exactly right. I want to start out with very simple stories and see how accurate they are. So this is the simplest story. It says the, pr the stock market, the price of, let's say, a share of stock is equal to the expected P star, which is the, uh, I call it P star, it's the ex post rational price. It's what the stock market would be worth if people really knew the future. They don't know the future, but they make an optimal forecast of the future. Uh, and so, I'm going to show you data, but I have to rush through this, <laughs> given our time constraint. Uh, it'd probably take me two hours to deliver this properly. But <laughs> uh, I also like to look at long historical data. So one thing you can clearly take away from this, that blue line here is the U.S. stock market from 1871 to 2013. And that blue line is showing the ups and downs of the stock market. And you can see uh, some big events. For example, uh, do I, I don't have a clicker, right? I can't. 
or do I? Can I move? Anyway, this is 1929, okay? This is the stock market crash of 1929. Uh, this is 2000. This is the stock market crash of 2000. The boom we're going through here is right up there, okay? Now, what I've plotted alongside this is the actual market, if everybody knew the future. Uh, and there it is. Uh, well, I've got two of them. The problem is I don't know the future after 2013, so I had to make some assumptions. So I've got two different models, uh, two different estimates of the ex post rational stock market. Now, I don't know if I've explained this well enough, but you can see that what I call f the, f the true value that the stock market would have if everyone knew history perfectly behaves pretty smoothly and steadily. But the actual stock market goes up and down a lot. I had a plot of this in my 1981 paper, and, but I only had it between these two lines because I, I was writing in 1981. It's a long time ago. Uh, since then, uh, the market has continued to behave pretty much the same. Uh, and the, uh, the present value of dividends has remained pretty much the same. So I think nothing fundamentally has changed. My view of the world is this stock market is showing repeated bubbles. So the 1920s was a bubble. It burst in 1929. The 1950s, 60s was a bubble. It burst again after 1974. There are periods of enthusiasm and optimism. I know fam <laughs> Gene doesn't agree with this at all. But the, uh, uh, this is how science proceeds, right? We have different, I'm gonna present evidence, so. Uh, this is my, well, this is, this is evidence right to start with. <laughs> um, so, uh, this clicker doesn't. This is just uh, real dividends on the U.S. stock market since 1871. Uh, and there's a trend line fit through it. It's pretty trendy. It's been just growing <clears throat> something like 2% a year for 130, 140 years. It's grown faster in the last 10 years. You can see the blue line is dividends and the red line is just a line fitted through it. And the stock price should kind of average out that. So stock prices really shouldn't vary very much. I mean, there's no historical reason just in dividends. So maybe it's something else. Uh, so I, uh, uh, now this is parallel to what uh, uh, Lars and uh, Gene talked about. The present value doesn't have to have constant discount rates. It can have discount rates that depend on interest rates. That's what I have in this model. Or it can have a, what Lars was saying was a stochastic discount factor. Or Gene was talking about business conditions uh, that might plausibly affect the stock market. So th this is the problem. Efficient markets hypothesis doesn't say the stock market is unforecastable. Uh, so we can try other variations on market efficiency. Uh, and I've got a couple of them here. Now, I hope this is clear. What, what I like to do is look back at history, going really far back, back to 1871, and ask what people, if people had valued the stock market this way and had known the market future perfectly, how would they have priced the stock market? And this is the thing, I, so I, I have, th again, this is a plot of an, of, this is an update of a plot in a paper I wrote 20 years ago or something like that. Uh, what I have here is the same, the blue line, again, is just the U.S. stock market. That now it's annual data. It's in real terms from 1871 to 2013. And the, and the green line is the, is the line we had before. It's the perfect foresight price. What the market would have by our model been valued at if people knew the future perfectly. But I've added on two other lines. One of them is, uh, this, th th this one here is the uh, uh, present value discounted by interest rates. Uh, and uh, the other one here is the model that Lars was talking a lot about, the stochastic discount factor model. Uh, and uh, what you see is that none of these models uh, seems to suggest a reason for the fluctuations in, in uh, 
the stock market that we've actually observed. Uh, uh, so I, I, I guess my attitude is, uh, why are we so interested in the efficient markets model? <laughs> uh, because uh, we haven't seen any compelling evidence for it. Now, it may be that we have trouble rejecting it, uh, but it depends on your model of human nature. The, 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 these various stories seem to have difficulty accommodating some facts. Like, for example, here, the, the, uh, the stochastic discount factor model says the stock market should have been really high in the Great Depression. Uh, why is that? Oh, this isn't, I'm sorry, the actual discounting with future interest rates model says that. Why? Because interest rates were very low in the Depression. So the stock market should have been high. But it wasn't, it was low. I just don't see any inspiration. I'm, I'm putting a very non-inspirational picture up for any of these models. So what I think is happening probably in these ups and downs of the market is we're seeing repeated fads or fashions or social epidemics that come and go. Uh, and they're, they're integrated with the economy. They're difficult to understand. Uh, but uh, uh, in my 1979-1981 paper, I argued that the stock market is too volatile for... Uh, uh, to, to be rec reconciled with simple models. It just goes up and down too much. It's because people are inconstant. Uh, I, I, I put that as a question. I didn't claim to have proven that either. But it, it seemed to me, judging from all of the evidence. Actually, this goes back to a paper I wrote with Jeremy Siegel in 77. Since then, other people have written about exactly this topic, including Lars Hansen and Ravi Jagannathan, uh, uh, who I see right over there. In the, in the, uh, and there's been an enormous amount of discussion. I, I, I think this literature is not done. It continues to go. But to me, it appears that the market is too volatile. It's just noisy because people are a little crazy or a little bit. <laughs> there, there's a social psychological component. And I think that it's difficult to summarize our state of the knowledge of it. But there are so many people that I respect who've talked about this in negative terms or positive terms, it's just not resolved yet. Uh, my colleague John Campbell and I, who was a student of mine at Yale, uh, we wrote about a dozen papers about this. Uh, this is one paper that John Campbell uh, studied, uh, produced, that gave a variance, I won't explain this slide, it's too complicated, but it gave a variance composition, decomposition of stock market movements and concluded that uh, something like uh, only about a half to a th or a third of the fluctuations in the stock market could be explained by uh, evidence about future dividends. So most of the market is, is, uh, doesn't make sense. Uh, there's a theory that John Maynard Keynes wrote about in the 1930s called the beauty contest theory. He said the stock market is not like, it already f precursors to efficient markets were being discussed. He said it's not like that. The market is like a beauty contest. Now he was referring to a particular beauty contest that he saw in the newspaper. Someone had a picture, uh, some newspaper had a hundred pictures of pretty faces and they asked you to pick the six prettiest and send it into the newspaper and you'd win if the six that you chose were closest to the average six. And he thought, well, how do you win a contest like that? Well, you win a contest like that by not, you don't pick the ones that you think are prettiest. You think, what would other people think are the prettiest? But then again, that's not right either. You should try to pick the six faces that other people think that other people think are prettiest. He said, the stock market is like that. You're not trying to pick the best companies. You're trying to pick the companies that in a month or a year, the market will come to like. So we're always trying to guess each other's psychology. Now, he wrote that in 36. It is very much alive today. And, and the, the profession is not all hooked on efficient markets. And we have lots of people here who are writing 
papers that are trying to, I think the beauty contest is, a, uh, is emerging as a very important theory of stock market fluctuations. And these people are trying to figure out what it means for policy, what it, uh, how it, uh, it helps us understand things like the volume or volatility of the market through time. And this is an ongoing thing. The other thing that I'd like to say though, is that if you look at, I've, everything I've said now is about the whole stock market, but if you look at individual stocks, efficient markets looks better. Uh, in fact, I'm referring to a paper by Tomo Valtinajo that found that most of the fluctuations in individual stocks is due to information about future dividends. Uh, that's because the, there's more variance of the fundamental. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is a paper that I wrote with Ji-Man Jung uh, some years ago, where we looked at individual stocks. Now, the funny thing about the stock market, uh, we got, I, I, want, I asked Ji-Man to find for me a list of all stocks on the crisp tape, that's from the University of Chicago, that lists uh, stocks and their returns. Find all stocks that have been on the tape with no interruption and no change since 1926. It turns out there's only 49 in the United States. And what we plotted here uh, is the dividend, is, is a scatter of the f subsequent actual dividend growth against the dividend price ratio uh, for stock. I'm, I don't have time to really explain <laughs> what you're seeing here. But you see a negative, and each point is a firm year. Uh, and you see a negative slope here. Uh, the negative slope is what you should see in this thing. What, it, what I'm learning from this diagram, and you can go look at our paper if you, I don't have time to really es establish what it, I'd like to talk for two hours if I could actually. <laughs> but it shows that uh, firms, uh, th that prices of individual stocks are not nonsense. For example, you see all the zero dividend stock and you look at the expected return, they tend to have high dividend growth afterwards. It's, people know, they, they know that some stocks are a problem and so the market price means something. So I'm, it, I'm not entirely negative about efficient markets. It works to some degree. I wanna move then to uh, my home price indices and then I still have uh, some time. I, the, the irony about economic research is that it often misses, it seems like we have fads and fashions in, e in academic departments just as we do uh, in financial markets. There's been a, uh, a lot of research on the stock market, much less on other markets. In the late 1980s, my colleague Carl Case and I decided, decided to produce a price index for homes that is analogous to a stock price index, so that it could be used to evaluate homes as an investment. And uh, it was Case who really came up with the idea in 1986 for a repeat sales home price index. Uh, and, and although actually Bailey, Muth, and Norse had proposed it in 63, uh, never produced it. No one had ever produced an index like that. Uh, and we wrote a bunch of papers, like uh, Chip Case and I, and Alan Weiss. Uh, what we did then is thought, we thought that nobody really knows how housing is done as an investment because the existing indexes weren't right. Funny, isn't that funny? Uh, housing is just as big and important as the stock market, but back in 1980s, there was no reasonable stock or housing price index. Uh, and so again, it's fashions and fads in research. It just hadn't been happened yet. I find it odd. But we produced a, a home price index and this is our, our, our plot of it from uh, 1987 when we started producing it. Uh, computer tapes were starting to appear. We, we could get millions of home sales. And we could calculate the index using a lot of data. Now there was another index at the same time which was, the, uh, which was around, uh, it was called the uh, constant quality index produced by the United States Depar Bureau of Census. So we produced a, a, a price index, but they weren't based on repeat sales. What they're looking at is the price of a 
constant, how, good, I have 10 minutes. I think I can stay in that time. What they're looking at is the price of a standard house, uh, which has so many bedrooms, so many square feet of floor space, uh, and a two-car garage, that kind of thing. And they, they go and they look at people who are building those houses today, and they, they compute an index of what that home price is. And that was what we had. That was the most scientific uh, price index when we wrote. But it, we look at what happened. The, the, the census index never showed much of the bubble that we saw in home prices. And you have to ask, well, why not? I think the reason is, is that they were just pricing different houses at different times. When it gets expensive in the center city, home prices go up a lot, but that means it's, you can't build there anymore. Land is too expensive. So they build houses far out. And you're, you're getting home prices, they're selling at cost, roughly. And, and, you know, it doesn't change much. What we developed was an index of existing homes. And we were very careful to make sure that changes in our index depended only on changes in the price of existing homes. And we discovered this huge bubble, uh, which would, no one would have seen. Uh, so uh, we managed then to get the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to create a futures market based on our index. Uh, and while it's not a lively traded uh, futures market, it's been going now for seven years and it continues to, con continues to price it's the only one in the world. Uh, it's based on our index. So what it's showing today, and this is, you can find this on the website, homepricefutures.com. It shows, th the black line is the actual bubble, I would say, and burst in home prices. Uh, in, uh, the peak was in 2006. And then we had this doldrums for years. And suddenly home prices started picking up. And then, now the green, that's actual. The green line is what the futures market is predicting. So we have a market in the Chicago that's predicting that home price, in fact, it ends in 2018. But I'm, I, when will it reach this blue dash line, which is the old high? It looks to me like uh, 2019, 2020. Um, so we're having a recovery. The market is now starting to predict the increase. Uh, but it's predicting a slower increase than we saw the last time. Uh, now, the funny thing about these home price movements is they're big, and they're not explained by economic variables. So, for example, you can this is home prices divided by personal income for the city of Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a very bubbly city. I, well, I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> That's my view of it. Why are they so bubbly? Oh, I, my my sister-in-law from, uh, from the area is smiling. It's because the Angelinos think that they're so special. <laughs> they think they have the most beautiful city in the world. But they're not consistent. They get excited and then they get, uh, uh, then they get uh, 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 upset and it's related to the whole economy. Uh, uh, I made a plot of, I tried to get as best I could, a plot of home prices in the United States from 1890 to the present. And uh, uh, you can see that we've had an enormous run-up in home prices and then an enormous collapse. That's 2006. Uh, and building costs don't explain it, population doesn't explain it, interest rates don't explain it. I think it's a bubble, okay? And I know jo I'm not convincing Jean Fama. But uh, uh, by the way, we're right now in Stockholm. Uh, we don't have a long time series for, for uh, Sweden, but we have for some nearby countries. Uh, Norway has, Norges Bank has a good home price index for Norway. And it shows a similar thing going up, except it's still going up. It didn't collapse like ours did. Uh, and I think this, something like that is happening in Sweden. Why are these things happening? That's, uh, that's something I don't, I think that we're learning more and we don't have answers yet. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that it is a bubble. So um, there's been another revolution in finance that 
we call the behavioral finance revolution. This is what uh, Gene Fama didn't get to in his talk. But, and I didn't, I'm not getting to it as much as I'd like either. It's been going on for 20 years now, so that economists are bringing in psychology, sociology, and other fields more. Let me just mention some really important things. In 1893, French sociologist Emile Durkheim came up with the concept of collective consciousness. What he was saying is that the way we think at any time in history depends on what other people are thinking. We, we think the same thoughts. Certain ideas re reverberate in our mind because we hear them all the time from other people. And then in 1925, Maurice Halbox, another uh, French sociologist, came up with the concept of the collective memory. What he said is that what you remember at any point of time depends on what you've heard other people say. You know, your mind forgets. Unless memories are reinforced, they just go away and you don't remember them. So you remember a set of facts that you've heard repeated many times. And when you try to evaluate things like the housing market, you are going to come to the same conclusions as everybody else because you don't remember some important facts. And you don't remember them because nobody's talking about them. I could tell you about the housing bubble in 1943 to 53 and use that as an example, but I bet hardly anyone here knows anything about it. If you could go back in a time machine, you could stop anyone on the street and they'd tell you about that bubble. But, but we, we forget and so we repeat mistakes from the past. Irving Janis was a social psychologist who in 1971 wrote a book called Groupthink. And it's about how expert groups make terrible mistakes. Uh, and they do so partly for these kinds of reasons, but partly because of people's uh, social tendencies. The tendency to self-censor, to not want to express opinions that deviate from the group opinion, uh, and so on. Selective attention was talked about by William James in his 1890 Principles of Psychology. He said that people pay attention to certain things, there are structures in our mind that help define what we pay attention to. One thing is that well, there's a social basis for attention. We tend to pay attention to the same things as everyone else. So we get reinforced in certain fallacious beliefs at one time or not another because you, you just naturally look at what other people are looking at. Uh, the equity premium puzzle, uh, which Prescott and Mara uh, pointed out, is an example of a, I think, kind of a selective attention phenomenon. In my book, um, Irrational Exuberance, I emphasize the news media as an important part of speculative bubbles that drives them. The news media amplify certain social epidemics. Uh, not, not, not maliciously, uh, but they're a business and they have to attract attention. So they tend to focus more attention on ideas that are already in the public attention. Um, I think that in understanding speculative bubbles, we have to be eclectic. And I think that what people are doing right now in the field of population biology, in the medical school, the, the epidemiology departments, and what's going also on in medical schools in neuroeconomics. We're, not, we're learning more about the human brain. All of these research directions are changing the way we think about ourselves. And economics can't stand in isolation and ignoring all of these things that are happening. There's a lot of, in, to understand complex phenomena, we have to take account of every different kind of human uh, uh, expertise. But this is my last slide. Now, I want to say, though, that I've just made this strong pitch for other social sciences and for a broad approach to understanding uh, uh, economic phenomena. On the other hand, I come back to Dean at the end and say, yes, I think efficient markets is, is a worthy theory as a crude approximation. We have to teach it to our students. And I teach... Fama and Hansen to my students because I believe that there is some truth to efficient markets. It, it's not perfect, but on, what it also means 
is that our financial markets are useful. They're useful, although they crash at times and they do the wrong things. But we, we, we in fact, in the future, ought to expand the scope of our financial markets to, so that there'll be more pricing. And unfortunately, there'll be more bubbles and bursts. But that's part of an imperfect world. But I, I, I've argued, in, well, I have a book called Finance and the Good Society that came out last year. Uh, I, I think that we will be pricing more things, not just real estate, but there are things like longevity. The European Investment Bank tried to create a market for longevity, lifespan expectations. It hasn't taken yet, but that's the kind of thing that will happen because it's an important economic concept that there should be a market for it. And there should be markets that capitalize flows like GDP or energy prices or even occupational incomes. These ideas that might sound strange today will, with better computer technology and better understanding, uh, help, uh, help us uh, advance to a better civilization. So what I've done is presented imperfect evidence uh, along lines of my fellow Nobelists, but with a different emphasis uh, and with a conclusion that's maybe radically different about bubbles, <laughs> but not radically different about the general importance of our financial markets. So, and I would like to invite all of the laureates uh, on stage. Um, and take the opportunity to give them another break, uh, another big hand. Um, thank you so much.